Um, okay, so my last talk is on misdiagnosis and body CT, and hopefully you all can see the slides. Um, you know, the, the thing we all worry about, I know all the residents, fellows, faculty on the call, basically is how do you do studies correctly? I think as radiologists, our job is to get the right answer on every patient. Uh, errors are always something we deal with and we try to minimize. I have given a talk on errors for many years and keep updating it. And when I updated it most recently, I kind of realized that also the amount of errors have increased sort of in this post-COVID era. I think everybody is facing limited staffing at the technologist and radiologist level. We modified lots of protocols for the couple of years of COVID. And I think people have kind of gotten a little bit lackadaisical, perhaps, you know, for many years, we didn't give oral contrast, right? Because nobody wanted to take their mask off. Well, you know, now people often don't give oral contrast and they need to. And then also, you know, this is a great lecture series this morning and your whole weekend is a series of lectures. But I think CME has really gone down a lot during this COVID era. I think uh, general fatigue uh, affects everybody. And it's shown now that medical error at a minimum is the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. And medical error really is underestimated because, for example, if you miss a lung nodule today, that's a sonometer, and the patient presents three years from now with a, a five sonometer mass with metastasis, and the patient dies, it's going to say lung cancer as the cause of death. It's not going to say misdiagnosis. When you could have cured the patient, you didn't, but then the patient presented when it was too late. And so medical error may be number two, particularly as the number of deaths from cancer and heart disease continues to decrease. Now, that article also made the point that human error is inevitable. None of us are ever going to be perfect. The only perfect person is someone who doesn't read any films. So you are going to make errors. The question is, what is it that we can do? knowing how people make mistakes to really minimize or decrease the mistake. Now, if you ask the question, how frequently are errors in practice? This is an article, and this article's numbers have been, this, have been shown to be correct by other articles. The rate of interpretation error is between 3 and 4% across all studies. However, studies that contain abnormalities, the error rate can reach 30%, which is an amazingly high number. Now, if you look at the majority of errors, they were errors of under-reading. So the number one error and the error that's most critical is under-reading. Because let's say, you know, Linda showed you a bunch of renal masses, and let's say you say this mass, maybe I'm not sure, maybe it's benign rather than malignant. Well, because you said there was a mass present, someone else is going to look at it, and hopefully they'll reach the right diagnosis. But if you read the, if the report says kidneys are normal, probably nobody is going to go back and relook at the scan. So under reading is the most problematic. <laughs> you also will say, what about speed? We're all reading more scans than ever. Well, there's no surprise that if you increase the rate of reading by 20%, you increase the rate of error by three times. People have also, so there's no doubt about it, that because we're reading more and reading faster, error rates are going up. They're not going down. And there's a recent article published from UCSF that made the point that this is for neuroradiology. This is in the ER setting. Uh, they made the point that errors were associated with higher volume shifts. Okay, and that's it. And and they're, they just showed very strictly pure error rates going up just based on volume. And their conclusion was in order to decrease the error rate, you need to decrease the volumes. And the errors were clinically significant. So their conclusion was, instead of reading 60 cases a day, they should read 40. However, they can't get the work done. So it's really reading 60. So now you know you're reading too much and your error rates are increasing. Now, people have written articles that suggest reading twice, have a second reader, and perhaps having a resident and a fellow help you helps that a little bit. But the reality is double reading doesn't work because you barely can get through the studies the first time, let alone have two people read them. 
You also know when you start looking at errors, how frequent they are, there's been a number of articles like this one published when you have outside films brought in and then reinterpreted, where error rates as high as 40% or 41% have been reported. And this was for head and neck imaging, but this is the same numbers that are published in articles on basic body trauma. So if you ask the question, why do we miss things on a CT? Often it's a poor search strategy. You're looking for rule out pancreatitis and there's a PE, but you weren't looking for the PE. There's poor understanding of pathology, overcalling or undercalling the presence of bowel pathology, making assumptions. Linda showed you some nice examples of renal masses, which looked, when you looked at quickly, they looked benign, but they were really malignant. They were papillary RCCs. Well, you're looking at an aortic dissection or a trauma patient, you're reading quickly, you're assuming that that's a benign lesion when it's not. Now, other reasons we myth things on CT, poor scan protocols, lack of oral contrast, delivery of IV contrast, or not giving IV contrast, or scanning in the wrong phases, or just looking at axials and not MPRs are some of the most common things I have seen. There was an article published in JAMA Surgery just a couple weeks ago. This is a wonderful article. You know, I mentioned in the first slide that because of COVID, everyone's trying to push things, no oral, no IV. And, you know, in the ER setting, lots of articles were written from ER docs why IV is not necessary. Well, this article was written by the surgeons and it sh with radiology, and it showed that unenhanced CT was 30% less accurate than contrast-enhanced CT for evaluating abdominal pain in the ER. 30%. Okay, that means you miss 30% of the findings because you did not give IV contrast. Now, you can argue IV contrast, potential risk, but it's very low risk. Patients with renal function, it's essentially has no risk. A small percent of patients could have reaction, but you have to give IV contrast. You can't assume a non-contrast study looks negative and is negative. You're going to miss 30% of important findings. Okay, so that becomes very critical. Protocol is everything. If you do the study correctly, you do dual phase when you need it, you give IV contrast, you give oral contrast, that makes all the difference in the world. Now, let's look at some other things. Okay, full field of view. Do you need to have full field of view? Normally, we do full field of view, but in two areas, cardiac CT and spine imaging, we don't. The reason we do it in the, coron the coronary area is because we want to look at the coronaries with the highest spatial resolution. So you need to do those targeted images, but you also, and so you get a nice look at the right coronary, but you also need to do the full field of view images because the same age group has lung disease and in this case, lung cancer. I remember when cardiac CT first came along and the cardiologist wanted to do it, they said we shouldn't read the entire lung because they're not requesting it. They're only requesting the coronaries. Well, the answer is we know better. You need to look at the entire study. And so here we are. So you can see this patient has lung cancer. You need to reconstruct the full field of view and dictate that. If you only do a coronary CT, you have 70% of the lung, but that indeed becomes important. In the lumbar spine, the same thing. This article by Lee made the point that a patient with back pain, you do a dedicated spine study, it's not uncommon to see extra spinal findings that are important. Most were benign, but others required workup, including carcinoma, lymphoma, sarcoid, AAA, and 4% of patients had important findings, and 80% of the time you would have missed these findings if you didn't do a full field of view image. Most neuroradiologists do only targeted views of the lumbar spine because they don't want to read the abdomen. You need to look at the entire abdomen because you may see the findings that are causing the patient's symptoms. Another practical thing, do you look at the topogram or scout view on all your cases? Now, in the old days, we always looked at the topogram because when before PACs, you had film and the technologists would always shoot the topogram, one without lines and one with lines. In this case, the patient was said to have retained barium they were running a post-op fever. When you look at the topogram, you realize there's no barium, but that's the ring, and that's the ring left on a sponge.
okay? So the patient had a retained sponge. That was the reason for the patient's fever. Or this case, again, patient post-op febrile, this was just felt to be residual barium and some artifact. But look at the topogram. It's hard to believe, that, but they left that retractor in the patient's abdomen. That's what was causing the pain. Here, it just looks like barium. Maybe you begin to wonder it's too much. But here, it's very obvious. You need to look at the topogram. Or this case, which was an IV study for dissection, where's the IV? You don't see anything on the study. Maybe you see a little bit right here by the axilla. When you look at the topogram, you see what happened. They extravasated right here, and the contrast is going up in the subcutaneous tissues um, along the inner arm and distally. Again, very easy to see what's specifically going on. Now, the question is, do you need to look at the topogram? I showed you a couple examples where it was helpful, but is that the rule? There was an article written from Hopkins, two very good radiologists, Bill Scott and uh, Bob Gaylor, who were expert plain film radiographers, read over 2,000 topograms in a row and read them like they were reading a plain film. And they found some finding of note in about a quarter of the cases. In most of the cases, those findings were seen on CT, so no issue. But in 2%, they found findings that weren't seen on CT. Now, that may be because the topogram covered more area than the scan. Maybe it had the chest and the imaging was only the abdomen, or it had some abdomen and the imaging was only of the chest. But in 2% of cases, it found findings that were important and would have gone unrecognized without looking at the topogram. Berlin wrote an article that made the point that although 2% is small, if you have 80 million, 85 million CTs a year, it means 1.7 million patients may have a finding that's critical but is missed. Now, the reason he wrote that article was because in, in his city, and this was reported in AJR, there was a case where the radiologist uh, evaluated a skull CT in a, in a child who fell read it as negative, a few hours later, the child had a seizure and died. When you look back at the CT, the, there was no bleed seen even by experts. But when you looked at the topogram, there was an obvious skull fracture that every member of the jury could see, but it was hard to see on the axials. And when they asked the radiologist why he didn't look at the topogram, the radiologist said, we don't look at topograms, okay? That was about a $3 million settlement in that case. So Berlin made the point that you need to look at the topograms. Even if you look at it just with a cursory look, you need to look at the topograms. And Itchri made the point that perhaps on our structured reporting, there should be a line for topograms, that I looked at the topogram and I saw this, I saw that, or I saw nothing. So that becomes very, very important. Now let's get down to a few specific things. Now remember, this is um, misdiagnosis. I'm not talking about, if I say bladder cancer, I'm not talking about cases where the patient has hematuria or you're staging bladder cancer. What I want to know is how often is bladder cancer an incidental finding and missed? Bladder cancer is obviously a very common cancer in the U.S. and worldwide. But my question is, how often is it an incidental finding? And if it's incidental, are you missing it? Well, how did this come about? I looked at this legal case for the Maryland Society, and uh, this was a patient who came in the middle of night, an older woman with acute abdomen, and the radiologist on this non-contrast study read this as ischemic bowel, and they were right. The patient had ischemic bowel, the patient went to surgery and survived, okay? The radiologist at that moment doing the study did not see that in the bladder there was a soft tissue mass. You fast forward three years later, now you can see that the bladder cancer has more than doubled in size. The patient presented with metastasis. The patient died, and they sued for misdiagnosis. So the question to me was, how often are we missing bladder cancer as an incidental finding? Now, one of the things we recognize is bladder cancer, particularly when small, is very vascular. As we scan more and more patients who are older, think about all the aortas we scanned, we give patients 500 cc's of water before the study, so the bladder is distended. What you have to remember is any enhancement in the bladder at all, even five millimeters, is going to be suspicious for bladder cancer. So here's a patient with an aortic study. 
and there's a five millimeter lesion at 12 o'clock in the bladder. You can't blow that off. That's a bladder cancer. There it is on the sagittal view as well. Another case, here it is by the UV junction, a little over a centimeter, an enhancing lesion. Again, shown nicely on the coronal views. That's a bladder cancer. Or this case where there's a little bit larger lesion, but also a bladder cancer. We realized that we were missing bladder cancers, and we just published a study which shows that bladder cancers are often missed unless the patient has hematuria. So what you need to do, you need to be very conscientious, particularly in cases where you're doing aortas, older patients, good vascular enhancement, bladders distended. Take a look at the bladder. If there's anything enhancing in the bladder, you have to worry about a cancer and recommend cystoscopy. There's no magic, but you will see, you will pick up many bladder cancers that are commonly missed. Obviously, if you had delayed scans and the bladder was distended with contrast, it's easy to see as well. But again, you saw the range of findings that were typically missed. So you need to be very careful. And we published this a couple of years ago. I haven't seen us miss a bladder cancer in a long time at Hopkins because now everyone is very careful. But unless you make an effort, you're going to miss bladder cancers. Other things, common sources of error. Pulmonary emboli. Now we all do pulmonary emboli and we're all pretty good at it. I think, I don't know, I can't do a show of hands, but a lot of people are using AI. AI tends to even make us better. But that's not what I'm talking about, the rule out PEs. I'm talking about the incidental PEs. And what we found commonly when I was doing a lot of 3Ds of the pancreas, when we only would scan the lower lung fields, and the radiologist reading it first would look at the three by threes or five by fives and would say nothing about the lower lungs. And I would pick up incidental pulmonary emboli. Incidental PEs are common in up to 5% of patients with cancer. Patients are asymptomatic or it's not felt to be symptomatic because they're tired. They have all sorts of symptoms, which everyone relates to their cancer. You need to look very carefully. Here's just a good example of a pancreatic cancer. There's a PE in the lower lung field. It's interesting, most of the PEs, 90%, are in the right lower lung. So really look carefully at the right lower lung. But it's very, very important to look because you will pick up incidental PEs. Once you pick them up, all the patients are treated uh, with therapy. Now, um, it's very important to... Uh, Remember that this is one of the areas which AI is playing a big role now. And this has been a couple articles. Now, uh, Charlie White in Maryland made the point that uh, PE studies uh, are often missed on abdominal CT for the same reasons I mentioned. One of the articles just published uh, this one and another one talking about using uh, AI for pulmonary emboli. It shows that one of the most common areas of PE detection is patients when you're not really looking for PEs, where it's routine oncology patients or routine chest CT patients. So it becomes very important. Our work provides more scientific ground for the concept of AI augmented radiologists instead of the, the theory of radiologists replaced by AI. But PE is one of the things you really want to look at. This article in Radiology, just published a couple months back, made the point high diagnostic accuracy and significantly shortened the time of diagnosis in patients in a setting with backlog of exams. So if you're very busy, let's say looking at oncology patients, maybe a study done in the morning at nine o'clock isn't read till two o'clock. But if you have the software running all the time at 9.05, you will know there's a PE present and you will read that study quickly. Okay, another problem, gastric tumor detection. I mentioned one of the challenges we have, and I know you have, is having the patients always get oral contrast. And oral contrast can be just water, but you need the stomach distension. One of the issues is that the ER docs often say no oral contrast. This was an article by Megabone Abdominal Imaging a number of years back, making the point that cutting corners is happening at the expense of excellence in patient care. You need to give oral contrast. And Perry Pickard, looking at his work, 
in oncology patients showed that when you went from oral contrast to no oral contrast, the number of misdiagnosis increased significantly. So some examples. This was a patient who was having weight loss and all sorts of symptoms, but this was a chest CT. If you look at the gastric fundus, now on a chest CT, we didn't give any water, but I really worry about the gastric fundus. Is there something going on here? We brought the patient back. We gave water. Look how well the stomach's distended. The stomach is absolutely normal. If you give water to every patient, patients are always thirsty anyway. The good news is you're going to eliminate the need for repeating this study. For a day, this patient thought he had gastric cancer till he realized he had nothing going on. And look how nice the stomach looked. When the stomach is distended, you can pick up incidental findings like gastric polyps there. You also can pick up adenocarcinoma, a patient with vague symptoms, just a typical ER patient. There's an infiltrating tumor in the antrum, which you would have missed if the patient wasn't given oral contrast. Or this patient, what do you do here? Is this thickened? Is this normal? Well, this patient was NPO because they were going for EUS, but that same patient a few months ago has hundreds of benign polyps in the stomach. Here, they're obvious. Here, there's no way you could make any diagnosis. Linda spoke about the kidneys. Critical things, phase of data acquisition, image display format, and rendering are all things that lead to errors. We spoke before about non-contrast CT. That's ideal for picking up renal calculi. But in a patient with hematuria, if you just say the study is normal, you're going to miss a lot of cancers. There's no perfect phase for the kidneys, but multiple phases are commonly necessary. I always worry in the ER setting when we say the stone study is negative. I think the clinician here is the CT of the kidneys is negative. But stone studies only tell you there's no stone. But you're going to miss small tumors, infection, and vascular pathology. This case was an ER doc who had hematuria told me the study was negative, and it looks negative. Look at that right kidney. looks fine. But I convinced him to get IV contrast against his best wishes. And look at that two and a half sonomy a renal cell carcinoma that's there and there on the delayed phase. Tumors that do not distort the outline will be missed on non-contrast studies. Again, you need IV contrast. Another example here, what do you do with this mass? Now, one thing important here is, I think Linda mentioned it, and I showed you an example, this little dot. Well, that lesion is minus 71. That means it's an angiomyolipoma. The entire lesion enhances, but that little bright dot makes it a myolipoma. But you can see the evaluation made it very simple to reach the right diagnosis. Also, people at times, particularly when the studies look normal, may only focus on the axials. You look quickly at the left kidney, it looks pretty good, but you know the cortical medullary interface should be perfect. It doesn't match over there, but it's much more obvious on the coronal that the patient has a renal cell carcinoma coming off the kidney. Or this case, I was checking a fellow who said this was normal, upper pole of the kidney, and maybe it is, but in the coronal, it's a carcinoma in the upper pole. Routinely looking at coronals and sagittals is critical with the kidney. If you don't do that, you're going to miss subtle tumors. We also know there are other mimics of malignancy, infection, and inflammatory disease. So be aware of that. Non-contrast CT, this was a stone study, some stranding around the kidney. I don't see a stone, but you need to give IV because then you see the patchy enhancement, you see the patient's polynephritis, so, and you see it bilateral. So again, very, very important. I also will comment on misdiagnosis in the ureter. The ureter, we always think about a dilated ureter, perhaps you need to see that in order to core pathology. But the reality is ureters can have small lesions within them, which you can see right here. You need to widen the window, uh, something like 550 over 50 rather than 400 over 10. And you can see there's something inside that ureter, which is a one centimeter ureteral tumor. But there's no hydronephrosis. 
but that tumor can be resected and the patient will have no metastasis. If you miss that, the patient will come back with widespread metastasis. I routinely look at MIP imaging of the kidneys because you can see here that lesion shows very nicely on the MIP imaging. Again, there's no hydronephrosis, but there is an obvious tumor in the patient's distal left uterus, left ureter, okay? Uh, and we wrote an article about this. It's worthwhile reading because you'll see lots of examples of where mistakes are made. Or in this case, you look at the kidneys quickly. They look okay. But when you look at the MIP imaging of the ureter, normal right ureter, abnormal left ureter, look at the irregularity here. That was a subtle infiltrating tumor. Again, easy to miss. There's no hydronephrosis. You could miss that very easily on the axial CT, but on the MIP imaging, it's much more obvious, or in this case, you follow the ureters down. Here's sort of a crescent I'm showing you there. There's that circle or donut. There's one ureter, there's the other, which means there's a filling defect. Here was a one centimeter tumor of the ureter. Again, these are the things we commonly miss unless we're very careful. We always think about the kidney with hematuria. Maybe we think about the bladder a little bit. We don't really think about the ureter unless it's obstructed, and that's a mistake. I mentioned looking at different projections, looking at coronals. You need to look at the sagittal views routinely in the abdomen. Anything vascular is going to be missed in up to 20% of cases without sagittal views. Now, obviously, that's true with pancreatic cancer staging, but I'm not talking about cancer. If you don't look carefully at the mesenteric vessels or the sagittal views, you're going to miss clot. We also always look at clot proximal because that's where atherosclerotic disease is. But with embolic phenomena, the clot is typically more distal. And so in this case, you look and you say, oh, the celiac looks good, maybe a little narrowing. SMA looks good. There's no plaque. But as you follow it down, the plaque is distal in the vessel. Okay, there's the, there's the thrombus in the patient's SMA. It's very obvious when you do the MIPS, when you do the reconstructions, but it's so easy to miss unless you're very, very careful. You need to look at the entire celiac and SMA and IMA. Everyone gets fooled, particularly distally. You don't, you know, you're kind of tracking the vessel down and you say it looks okay, but you need to see the vessel in its entirety. And the sagittal view is critical for doing that, as well as many other things that are vascular related. It's also important to look at sagittal views because of the bone. The last thing I do when I look at imaging is looking at reconstructions in the sagittal with bone windows. Patients, particularly older patients with back pain or abdominal pain, it may be because of osteoporosis. When you look at the axial views here, you see a lot of plaque in the aorta, DJD in the spine. But when you look at the sagittal view, you see the collapse of L1. One of the first of two AI uh, projects that is funded that you get reimbursement on is for osteoporosis of the lumbar spine because of the fact that 85% of compression fractures are missed on routine abdominal CT because people don't routinely look at the sagittal views. So you need to do that. That's a very common source of error and a very important error. I'll finish up with a couple of comments. There are a lot of things coming along to help us. There are things that help us count ribs, okay? And look for rib fractures is basically curve coronal reconstructions, but laid out nicely. Rib fractures are easy to miss, but also to me, they're often hard to count. Here you can see there's a first rib fracture, nothing very tricky, but here's the software which automatically counts the ribs for you, counts the vertebral bodies, lays out all of the ribs, and they lays out all of the ribs which you can then rotate, increases your accuracy by probably 30% for picking up rib fractures, also, it makes it much easier to count specifically what rib you're dealing with and make life very, very easy. We spoke a little bit about pancreatic cysts. I'll just make a comment. Pancreatic cancers, 40% of cancers, two centimeters or less that are present, and those lesions are typically the ones that are resectable or missed. 
A dilated pancreatic duct with an abrupt cutoff means you have a tumor. Here, the tumor is seen, but is subtle. But even if I don't see a tumor, to me, it's going to mean then there is a tumor present. You need to evaluate further. And again, you can see it very nicely from the coronals and the cinematic as well. The ability to look at transitions of duct become very, very important. We talk about neuroendocrine tumors. 20 years ago, we would say that we were 50% accurate with neuroendocrine tumors. Now we're 95 plus percent. And in fact, we pick up many endocrine lesions that are not suspected, which is a challenge. One of the things now it's felt that an endocrine tumor under 1 cm surely should not be removed. Some people will even say under 2 cm. I mentioned protocols. If you look at this case, it looks like a nice venous scan. No dilated pancreatic duct. I don't see a tumor, but there's a tumor there. If I had the arterial phase, there's the tumor. Again, your accuracy on CT is going to be dependent on your protocols. If you want to rule out a pancreatic mass, it could be neuroendocrine. You must do arterial and venous phase imaging. Look at that two plus sonometer mass you would have missed. Here it's obvious, but it's not distorting anything. It's not causing duct dilatation. That's how easy it is to miss things. Again, it's a challenge for us, particularly in the ER where you don't have all the phases you need, and perhaps the techs are designing the protocols. You need to be very careful. Here was just another example of a renal cell. Um, looks good. Distal pancre patient had a uh, left nephrectomy. Here's the patient's pancreas. But when you gave arterial phase, there was metastasis. But look how easy it was to miss. A three centimeter mass, easy to see. So protocols become everything. I think you need to be certain that you have your protocols updated twice yearly. I think it's important also that you train your technologists in doing the protocols. I think case conference, we had discussed protocols becomes very important. Now, things people are doing, I think AI is going to be big. Some people use checklists. Some people like checklists for reporting. Um, we have some checklists online. If you're an Apple user, you can download for free from the Apple store. We've done checklists on pancreatic masses and adrenal masses as a way of walking you through the tumors and making better decisions. So there's a lot more we can do. AI, I think, is going to be very big. Articles now show AI is surely better than humans in picking up lung nodules. It's more reproducible. It's better on PE and things are going to, it's better on osteoporosis and it's going to keep getting better and better. We've spent a bunch of time, Linda and I, the past seven years working on early detection of pancreatic cancer. And we believe that that's the way you're going to pick up incidental pancreatic cancers. The computer is going to find the tumors and predict precisely what they are at an earlier stage. Now, I think all of us make mistakes. There's no doubt about it, and no one's going to be perfect. I think hopefully what this talk makes the point is by reviewing cases, by reviewing your errors, you're always going to make that first mistake perhaps, but the key is not making it a second time. And with that, thank you for your attention.